lot of uh, scriptures we're going to today. I don't know if Dallas can keep up with us or not, but Uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> Second Corinthians five seventeen. Okay, uh, let me just say a couple things as we begin. Many things, you know, happen uh, the very moment we get saved, and um, and, when, and it's an exciting thing as a new Christian. Uh, to begin to discover little by little as you read your Bible, as you come to church and hear preaching, and you begin to discover all that God did for you just in that moment that he saved us. And so thank the Lord for his goodness, and uh, thank the Lord for all the things that he has done for us. When we went through uh, the book of Romans, we uh, outlined a lot of those things are uh, in the book of Romans and those great doctrines of the faith and most of those took place uh, at the very moment of our salvation. The second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given us, given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation." Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Uh, I want to take those phrases out in verse 17. That's a, ver a familiar verse. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of times we quote that verse for different reasons, but uh, it's, the, it's that phrase that says, uh, he is a new creature. He's a new creature. He's a new person. And old things pass away. All things become new. So ask yourself the question. Only you know, really know. Are you a new creature? When you got born again, when you got saved, or made a profession of faith in Christ, did you become a new creature? I know that I can only tell you what happened to me, but I know when I was, well, before I was saved, I was so backward and bashful, and I'd afraid to get up in front of the class and, and give a book report or anything like that. I just, that's the way I was. But when I got saved, I became a new creature, and all that passed away, and I, I become bold in my witness, and uh, preached to the whole high school. Uh, back then we still had um, chapel service about once a month, and I went to the principal and I said, could I, could I preach in chapel? He said, yeah, if you want to. I said, I want to, amen. And so uh, the Lord helped me preach, and then everybody in the high school, I think we had about 400 kids uh, in the high school. And uh, from that day they knew that I was a Christian, and uh, just got the whole thing over with. Everybody knew where I stood. And so you're a new creature. Uh, you're a new personality sometimes. I mean, you've, if you've seen somebody get saved and you knew them maybe all your life and they were just this kind of person, all of a sudden they got saved and born again. And now they're just completely changed, just completely different. The things they loved before, they don't love anymore. Things they hated, like church and Bible and prayer and all that. Now they love those things, and it's just a wonderful change. Uh, there's that song that says, What a wonderful change in my life since Jesus came in. Now notice this in these verses here, that there are four things that he mentions. He says, number one, we are a new creature. That's in verse 17. In verse 19, he says, we have been reconciled to God. Reconciled means you bring two enemies together and they are reconciled. They go from being 
enemies to friends. They go from being adversaries to, uh, to uh, we would say, uh, not only friends, but partners. And you have that feeling. I know when I got saved and when I went to church, I knew the people there. I'd gone to Sunday school there most of my life. And uh, so when I got saved, walked in there, I knew everybody. But it was a whole, looked at church a whole new way. And I uh, wanted to be there, and I loved to be in there. And I was there for two years before I left uh, for college. You notice this in verse 18 and 19. We have been called. We have been called into the ministry of reconciliation. God uses people to bring others to himself. The angels of God are not going to come down, preach to the people in Blue River and David. That's our responsibility. He has given us the ministry of reconciling people to God. In that calling, he has given us, the Bible says, the word of reconciliation. Thank God for the gospel. Thank God for a completed Bible that we have now. Uh, they did not have in Paul's day. Uh, but we have the word of reconciliation. Now we know how to tell people uh, exactly what they must do to be reconciled to God, to go from being the enemies of God uh, to becoming a child of God. We have a word of reconciliation. And then he also says that now we are ambassadors for Christ. And that goes right along with the ministry, the calling. We are ambassadors for Christ. Uh, you hear about a lot of that on the news right now with this thing in Ukraine, and we've got ambassadors going to different countries uh, and trying to keep peace and trying to talk to other nations about getting involved and helping Ukraine and all that. But... Uh, we are ambassadors not for our nation. I'm an ambassador is a person who represents one nation to another nation. Uh, and so when we got saved, God called all of us, not just the pastor, uh, the missionary, or the evangelist. God called his people to be ambassadors for him. We represent another world, heaven, to this world and we, we want to be a good testimony, we want to be a, a good ambassador, and the ambassador only has the authority to say what the government has said, or the White House has said, or the, um, uh, we would say the president has said, Congress has said, uh, Senate has said, we can only, the, an ambassador can only, he just can't go over there and make up stuff. He's got a mission. Here is what the United States uh, asked me to do. Here's what they asked me to say. And we're not making up our gospel. We thank God we have the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have been called to be ambassadors. We're going to be a good testimony, uh, not only just in our life, but testifying of another world that's uh, interested in our world, another world where God lives. And he came down, sent his son into this world to die for the sins of the world. And the Bible says even in this passage here, uh, that he was reconciling the world unto himself, in verse 19, not imputing their trespasses unto them, but hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So God, uh, that part of that message is, God does not want to impute um, sin and judgment to people. He wants them to be forgiven. He wants to be reconciled. And he was reconciled with Adam in the garden until he sinned. And Adam had to offer that sacrifice. He was reconciled back to God after having sinned against God. Now notice in verse 17, I want to say, first of all, talk about the fact of the new creature. Uh, Paul states a spiritual truth that became a reality to every person who has truly repented and believed and surrendered to the Lordship of Christ. There are no ifs, ands, and buts, he says, that if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. It doesn't say he might become a new creature. It doesn't say he could become a new creature. It says that if he is in Christ, and in Romans 8 9, we have a new spirit, but we are not in the flesh 
but in the Spirit, if so be, that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So the moment you got saved, you received, and this is not an experience, you didn't speak in tongues, this is just one of those facts that happens to a child of God. The moment he gets saved, God gives him the Holy Spirit. He is called the Spirit of Christ. And uh, he said, if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not of God. You have not been born again. You're none of his. So you can be saved and ha not have the Spirit of God living in you. So you got this new nature. It's righteous. It's divine. It's holy. It's a new spirit. It's the Holy Spirit. And then in Ephesians 1.13, he said, In whom also you trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So we have the Holy Spirit, and one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, a lot of ministries, the Bible says the Spirit of God teaches us, He keeps us, He warns us, He speaks to us, and here it says that He is, we are sealed by the Spirit. Now I believe and you believe that if a man is truly saved and born again, he has been sealed by the Spirit of God and he cannot lose his salvation. He cannot lose something that you are sealed by the Holy Ghost. And uh, he goes on to say other things about that in chapter 1 of Ephesians verse 14, but we'll stop there with that thought. So we have a new nature. It's a divine nature. It's God's nature. It's a holy nature. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. It's not a fake holiness. It's a true holiness. We have a new spirit. If we don't have the spirit, we're not of Christ. We're sealed by the spirit. And so that means he is with us. And it is the spirit that says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So we're kept by that spirit. But we are enabled and changed and uh, transformed by this Holy Ghost of God who lives in us. We have that new nature. You know what the new nature does? The new nature gives us the desire to live right. It gives us the desire. If you're saved, you want to live right. And then it gives us, by the Spirit, it gives us the power to do right. So he said, I'm going to give you a new nature that wants to do right. It's created in true holiness. It'll make you want to live for God. But you can't do it on your own, so I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He's going to empower you. He's going to fill you. He's going to put the, uh, develop the, cultivate the fruit of the Spirit in your life. The Bible says we don't walk after the flesh, but after the Spirit. And then he goes on to say, and the fruit of the Spirit is... And he tells us what it is, love, joy, and peace, and long-suffering, and goodness, and meekness, and temperance, and faith. He says, against such there is no law. So we have a new nature, we have a new spirit, and we have a new father. I want you to look at Hebrews chapter 12. And you need to, if you have your Bible, turn there if you can. Uh, it's just uh, probably about 30 or 40 pages to the right of you. Of, uh, our, our scripture in 2 Corinthians. But if you can find that, Dallas will have it on the board, but it, it'd be good to underline some of these things. In chapter 12 of Hebrews, God begins to speak about the chastening of God. He has a new father. You know what a good father does? He chastens his children. He disciplines his children. If you want a good old-fashioned word, he spanks his children when they do that which is wrong. Notice in verse 5, Hebrews 12, you have forgotten the exhortation, uh, uh, the exhortation which speaketh of you as under children. This He's quoting the Old Testament. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. So he says God is going to chasten us. God is going to rebuke us. Now, the motivation behind it is in verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, listen to this word, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. That's a strong word. That's the word they use when they 
when they took those uh, whip, the cat of nine tails, and beat the Lord Jesus, they scourged him. So that gives you an idea of how strong sometimes the Lord has to deal with us and he has to scourge us. And he says, every son whom he receiveth. Verse 7, if ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you with sons. And look back, let me go back to verse 6. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. Now I know a lot of fathers, um, and probably my father was one of those, he waited until he lost his temper before he, he, he got on to us. But God does not do it out of anger. Sometimes parents discipline their children out of embarrassment. You know, they, they did something to embarrass them in the community, and so they take them to the woodshed, and uh, they do it out of pride. They do it out of having been embarrassed by their child. But here God says he does it because he loves us. God knows how your life will end up if he just allowed you to go on and on and on in sin. Because sin destroys. The wage of sin is death. He goes on to say in verse 7, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? I mean, in Paul's day, when he writes this, evidently every father had the character to chasten his child, his children. He said, what father does not chasten his children? Well, I can tell you a lot of them today don't. They, don't, they, they wouldn't dare touch their child. But in verse 8 says, but if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, I have been chastened, you have been chastened, then are ye bastards and not sons. The bastard is the illegitimate child, the person who says, I'm a Christian, and yet he's living in sin, and he just goes on and on and on and on in sin, and just becomes a lifestyle with him. And God says, if God does not chasten you, you are not, you do not belong to him. He says in verse, uh, let's skip to verse 10, for verily, for a few days, uh, they chastened us, our fathers chastened us after our own, uh, their own pleasure. But he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Notice that when God gets through with the paddle, the result is holiness. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. When dad got to bed, I didn't say, hallelujah, glory to God, I get another spanking. <laughs> no, uh, no, I wanted to run. Verse 11, now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. So in verse 10, he says the result of chasing is holiness. Verse 11 says it bears the fruit of righteousness. It means when God, when you're a child of God and God chastens you, the result is you get right with God and you begin back on that path of holiness. Now I've seen people, and I've heard people say, oh, the Lord chastened me but they're living the same old way they always lived. And that's not chastening. God said, when I chasten you, you'll straighten up. You'll start walking right. You'll be the partaker of his holiness, and you'll bear the peaceful fruit of righteousness. You'll start to live right. And he goes on to say some other things, but we'll stop in verse number 12. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it be rather, let it rather be healed. He says in verse 14, But follow peace with all men in holiness. Notice this, without which no man shall see the Lord. He said there's not an aspect of holiness in your life. If you're not striving to live a holy life, there may be something wrong with your salvation. 
I was for three years um, the assistant pastor to Garvin Walls at the Grace Baptist Temple uh, in St. Albans. I knew him. He he came from North Parkersburg. He pastored a a large church up there, and. Uh, um, when he left, he asked me to go up there and serve as, like as an interim pastor until they found a pastor. And so I did that. I, I left my church, which was in South Parkersburg, went up to uh, what was then Briscoe Run Baptist Church. They averaged probably about six to 800 people on Sunday morning, Sunday night, probably about 500, Wednesday night about 350. So it was a good-sized church, a good church, solid, solid church, faithful church. And uh, while he was there in in Parkersburg, he had a real burden to go see his dad. His dad used to go to church. His dad was a song leader, deacon in the church there. But he wasn't right with God. He had gotten involved in politics. He became the mayor of their little town there and sort of drew him out of church. And so... But the walls drove six hours from Parkersburg, West Virginia, down on the outskirts of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, with a little place called Oliver Springs. And uh, that church also was about the same size as the church in, uh, not quite as big, but it, it, it probably is now. But anyway, he, uh, he, he got on his knees in front of his dad and said, Dad, you're not right with God, and I'm afraid of what God's going to do. God told me to come down here and talk to you and and beg you to get right with God. I mean, got down on his hands and knees in front of his dad and said, Dad, please, will you get right with God today and get back in church and back where you should be? And uh, he said, I can't do that right now. So Brother Walls got in his car and drove six hours back home. When he pulled into the, the yard there, his wife came running out. Uh, tears and he could tell she was upset and so he said what is the problem and he said uh, she said well I just got a phone call and your dad just dropped dead of a heart attack so he had to go back there of course for the funeral and all that but God gave him a chance to get right God gave him a chance to get right when I was in St. Albans, West Virginia, and pastor of the Landmark Baptist Church, we had a fellow in the church, a good man, he got saved. His name was Alan Williams, faithful to church, went on visitation, did all that, and he, he'd been a, a heavy drinker, got over all that. But he got a job working construction, and he had to go out of town on this construction job and put him in a motel with a bunch of other men that he worked with, and most of them were drunks, and and every night they'd come home and they would come to the motel and, and they'd drink and carry on, you know. And they finally pressured Alan to the point of drinking. He didn't drink, he didn't get drunk. Uh, but, uh, and because of that, when they ran out of beer, they asked him if he would drive and get some because he was the only one uh, who wasn't drunk and, uh, you know, wasn't too drunk to drive. And so he's headed down the road and he wrecks that truck that he was driving and breaks his leg. Well, when he got back home, in a couple of weeks, he came back in the church. He had this cast on his leg. And I said, Brother Allen, I said, what in the world happened? You get hurt on the job? He said, no, preacher. He said, I let him talk me into just drinking a couple of beers, and God whooped me. I wrecked the guy's truck. He said, I'm telling you what, he said, and broke my leg, and now I'm off work. And he said, and I said, well, uh, the chastening of God, good sign that you're saved because God chastened him. You remember King David committed adultery one time, just one time. And uh, God said to David, you know, thou art the man, sent the prophet of God and said, you are the man. And uh, when the baby was born, he lived just a few days, and he died. God took his, his child from him. I'm saying that God chastens. He's a father who loves, and for who he loves, he chastens. He scourges every son whom he receiveth. Now I want you to go to Matthew chapter 15, verse 18. 
And I want to look at the future of those who do not become new creatures, those who reject Christ and never become a new creature. And I want to key on, just key on uh, to a couple sins that are always mentioned at the top of the, these list of sins. Matthew 15 and verse 18, he said, But those things which proceed out of the mouth cometh from the heart, and they defile the man. So our sins originate in our heart, in our mind. Verse 19, For out of the heart proceeded, notice this, evil thoughts. What are the evil thoughts about? Murders, now notice this, adulteries, fornications, and then it goes on with thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. But I want you to notice the adulteries and the fornication. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Those who live an unrighteous life, a who practice an, un, an unrighteous life. He said they're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither, here's our word again, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, same sins again, right at the top of the list, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And notice, I mean, he's, he's being plain. He's, he's mentioned these sins. And um, he says they're unrighteous. These people are unrighteous. They practice these sins. They don't, they're not like David who just committed adultery one time. They live in sin. They enjoy their sin. Verse 11, and such were, notice that word were, they were some of you. So Paul writing to the first Corinthians, he said, hey, don't, don't get too self-righteous. This is what you were before you got saved. But now he says you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So Paul says here that these people will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those who practice such things. Not, not one incident, but this, this lives in these kind of sins. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 5 says, For this you know that no whoremonger, it's another word for adulterer, feminine, or uh, fornication, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of God, Christ and of God. So he's already said now, these people are not going, to, in verse 9, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In verse 5, he says, these people have not any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. He just, I mean, he states absolutely without question that these people who live in this kind of sin, they live in it, and I want to emphasize that, that they're not, they're, they're not saved. They're not going to inherit the kingdom of God and of Christ. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19 Galatians chapter 5 and verse 19, notice, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Here's the top two on all the list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Now listen to what he says. Of, uh, of the which I tell you before, as I have al also told you in time past, notice that they which do such things, that word do means those who practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then one last verse and we'll be finished. He says in Revelation 21 and verse 8, but the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers 
and whoremongers, there it is, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, those who make a life out of lying, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That is the future of those who have never been saved, never been born again, and it's, it is marked in their life that they practice such things. Not just, I mean, anybody can commit any of these sins. But if you, if you do it one time, let's go back. You have a new nature. And, and the new nature and the Holy Spirit will cry out and God will chasten you. That's the force behind it. And God will get you back on the right road. So you can't live in sin and the most miserable person in the world is a Christian who is living in disobedience to God, whatever it may be. But God says this is the future of those who have lived in sin. They may profess to be a Christian. I, I read a little thing last night, and uh, it was about a guy who was a pretty famous actor. And uh, he, he finally got religion and uh, uh, a Catholic, but he, he told all the movie places, I'm not going to have any more sex scenes. No, I'm not going to kiss another woman on screen. I got one wife and, and I love her and I'm not going to dishonor her. And uh, he had about four or five children. He said, I'm not going to do those kind of scenes anymore. And Hollywood just sort of blackballed him. And just sort of blackballed him. And, but he took a stand. And, uh, and I appreciate that. I don't know why, um, you know, but he said in there, I'm a Catholic. And uh, so he didn't do it because he got saved uh, out of religion, out of love for his wife, out of maybe um, respect for the church. Um, he gave up that. But later on, he, he, was, he said, I was years without work. And uh, until a guy called and said, I have a part I think you'll fit into, and told him what it was, he said, yeah, I can do that. And so finally he, he uh, got that job, and then he said the doors start opening up, and now I'm busier than I ever have been. God can take care of people like that. And God, God, even though he's not saved, I think God respects people like that. And the Bible says God blesses uh, those, causes his face to shine upon those who are, Saved and lost. He caused it to rain upon the righteous and the unrighteous. So sometimes a man just trying to do right, God will bless him, whether he's saved or not. And maybe eventually he'll see that Catholicism is not the way to heaven. I'm saying God will give you a new nature, give you a new spirit, and give you a new father that will chasten you unto righteousness and holiness. The result of chastening is people get right with God.